Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever all of you are. I want to uh, welcome you all to uh, another lecture here for, uh, for this course. Today we are going to enter into a new century. We're going to move out of the 1700s or the 18th century and we're now going to move into the 19th century. And the 19th century begins in the United States with what Thomas Jefferson called a revolution. And the reason why he refers to it as a revolution, and it's particularly because he actually becomes president of the United States. He wins the election of 1800. He's inaugurated in March of 1801. But the reason why he calls it a revolution is because he is um, <clears throat> convinced that a new political history has begun. Um, one of the things we, we spoke about earlier in this course was the formation of political parties. And um, of course, during John Adams's administration, um, there was a great deal of infighting and bickering between John Adams, the president, and Thomas Jefferson, who was his vice president. In fact, there probably hasn't been a vice presidential candidate who has attempted to undermine his president uh, as deliberately as Jefferson attempted to do. And in fact, the election of 1800 was rather divisive uh, and rather accurate. In fact, uh, what I want to do here, just give me one quick second as I grab my book. I want to read to you from a, a portion of a book called America. Uh, you can see this book's been well worn, <clears throat> but the book states this. It says, a tone of simplicity and conciliation ran through Thomas Jefferson's inaugural speech. The campaign between Federalists and Republicans, or what we've been calling Jeffersonians, had been so fierce that some had predicted civil war. Uh, and so when Jefferson takes his oath of office, he's really talking about this peaceful transition of political power from the Federalists into the hands of the Jeffersonians. Now, one of the things that you're going to want to be aware of, particularly those of you who are interested in the development of political parties in the United States, is that by the time that Jefferson and the Jeffersonians take control of the government, and here's just a, a quick sidebar. Um, in the election of 1800, the Jeffersonians had taken the executive branch and for the majority of the congressional uh, branch as well. Uh, and that really only left one branch of government open for the opposing party, and that, of course, is the Supreme Court. And so actually what John Adams does at the very end of his administration is he appoints a bunch of judges and he creates a bunch of new positions uh, and he's going to appoint uh, a bunch of federalists to those positions because of course judges have a, a lifetime job uh, and so Adams who recognized that the writing was on the wall for uh, the uh, executive and the Jew and the um, legislative branches he thought he could forever sort of influence the judiciary by putting a bunch of good federalists there this will directly lead to the court case known as Marbury v. Madison. And Marbury v. Madison takes place during um, Jefferson's administration, but the significance of that court case is that the Supreme Court gives itself judicial review. But sidebar over, back to Jefferson. One of the interesting things about the Jeffersonians, um, and this is true during Jefferson's tenure in office as well as the um, uh, after the War of 1812, is the Jeffersonians will begin to act like Federalists, and the Federalists will begin to act like Jeffersonians. It's a very interesting sort of flip, a very interesting sort of switch that takes place. Um, and you can see this very much so in uh, the Louisiana Purchase, right? Let's recall that Jefferson is of the opinion that <clears throat> a president or any political entity cannot do anything that is not expressly stated in the Constitution. Well, if you read the Constitution, nowhere in there does it state that a president has the ability to buy up half a continent, uh, which is what Jefferson will effectively do. But that stated, when Jefferson first takes his inaugural address in March 1801, he's planning on guiding the government based upon the principles that he thinks that the founding fathers were attempting to implement, and that is descaled government. And as far as Jefferson's concerned, um, he wants the country to be made up of a bunch of small farmers um, that would be independent, uh, which is interesting because, of course, they're not fully independent because in Jefferson's mind, of course, they would have slaves. Uh, and in fact, there's going to be a, an assignment coming up where you're going to be looking at Jefferson's uh, notions of slavery and some of his racial theorization 
which he used to justify the institution of slavery. It's kind of a theme we're going to try to run throughout this course is race theory uh, and the way that it affected American policy. But, excuse me, when Jefferson takes the other office, this is what he states. He says, we are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. You know, almost as if today we were to say we are all Democrats. We are all Republicans. Uh, and there's a lot of division still going on. It says, if there be any among us who would wish to dissolve this union or to change its Republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left to combat it. And then Jefferson concluded with a summary of the essential principles that would guide his administration. And some of his essential principles are going to be descaled government. One of the interesting things about Jefferson is that he doesn't like to spend lots of money. He doesn't think a um, uh, uh, having a lot of debt is a positive thing. And so one of the things that he's going to immediately set out to do, which he's then going to have to reverse himself on, is he's going to try and uh, scale down the size of both the army and the navy. Because, of course, if you're not at war with anybody, then it's just very expensive to um, really pay for that standing army if you're not planning on using it. Now, you may be aware of this, you may not be right. As Jefferson becomes president of the United States, we will go to war with a group of folks uh, in the Barbary states. We have been paying them tribute money because we didn't have much of a navy at this point, and yet we wanted to trade with uh, a variety of different uh, countries in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. And because we didn't have enough gunpowder, if you will, uh, we paid these Barbary pirates basically a, a, a tribute money not to uh, not to attack us. They eventually asked for, for more money, and Jefferson ultimately said enough's enough. Uh, I say all that simply to state that from the very beginning, Jefferson's going to have to reverse himself on some of his Jeffersonian policies, or he wants to govern with small-scale government. Um, but there's a lot of important things that happened during Jefferson's administration. Of course, we see um, <clears throat> the Louisiana Purchase, I already made mention of that. That was a, a massive land deal that was really important to the United States geographical development. Um, and there's multiple ways to think about the Louisiana Purchase other than just the facts of it, which is basically in 1803 for $15 million, which is roughly 3.4 cents an acre. We purchased Louisiana from Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon had uh, initially intended uh, to do something with the, with the Louisiana Territory. But he lost a conflict in Haiti, he was at war with Britain, he was going bankrupt, and so he needed money, so he unloaded the entire Louisiana Territory to the United States. And we really wanted access to that region because uh, initially the Spanish held possession of the New Orleans port, and they were pretty cool with the United States sending goods through there, but we weren't so sure that the French would be, and so Jefferson wanted to make sure that we would have access to that port. Uh, and so we end up buying it, and um, this, of course, helps Napoleon do fight off the British for a short period of time until, of course, he's defeated at Waterloo and sent off to St. Helena and Elba, not in that order, um, and where he will die eventually. Um, but the reason why the Louisiana Purchase is important is, one, it's very central to Jefferson's understanding of what a republic should look like. Land is very, very central, right? Recall, he wants farmers. What do farmers need? Farmers need land. So he purchases this land, and in his mind, he says, now we have enough land for basically forever for all Americans. Now, obviously, the population of the United States is nowhere near where it is today. Uh, but in his estimation, this was going to set the country on a proper track and to basically sort of create the vision of the nation that Jefferson really wanted. Um, but that's not what's going to happen. And in fact, in many ways, Jefferson is sort of the, the, the cause for the United States turning into an industrial manufacturing country as opposed to a... Uh, a country based upon farming, but the other reason why um, the other reason why the uh, Louisiana Purchase is important. Quick coffee break. Thank you. The other reason why it's important is because it significantly contributes to westward expansion. Eventually, we'll we'll have a section uh, referred to as Manifest Destiny, um, but Manifest Destiny is is referring to America's westward expansion. And the Louisiana Purchase not only provided the United States with territory to move into. Now, granted, nobody asked the Native Americans about it. And indeed, uh, once people start moving into those areas, Native peoples will be moved. And here's a digression, Rose, just real quick. And, and we have to think about this because in the larger scope of American history, westward expansion is really, really important, right? We start off as 13 
separate colonies, then we grow into a, a massive, one might call it an empire. It's a rather large country. But if you take a look at the history of westward expansion during the 19th century, one of the things you're going to find is that the white man will move into new western territories, new to them, not new to the natives who live there. But the white man moves, and in the process, Native Americans will have to be removed so that African American slaves can be transplanted and cotton grown. So white man comes in, Native Americans get moved out, black Americans move in, cotton is cultivated. Westward expansion is quite uh, central to the coming Civil War, which obviously we're a little early for that, but just recognize that that's there. But following the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory, we're going to have the Lewis and Clark exploration. I'm not going to get too much into that other than to say that their maps, their, their uh, narration of what was out there, particularly the abundance of beavers, uh, there's a beaver trade going on, beaver pelt. Um, this really contributes to people wanting to be able to move out west. Now, in addition to some of these domestic issues, Jefferson is also going to have to continue to deal with foreign policy issues. Recall there were some issues with the French and the British and the United States during Washington's administration, during Adams's administration, and they're going to hold, they're going to spill over into Jefferson's administration. And uh, although there's there's more context uh, in the videos and the and in the reading on this, which you'll need to look at, but the, here's the gist of it. Jefferson attempts to address the problems between the French and the British um, by implementing what we call an embargo act. You see, what is essentially happening is the United States has decided that it's going to maintain its neutrality. It's not going to get involved in these European problems. But what we will do is try to trade goods with both France and Britain. Well, there comes a point when both the French and the British, they decide that they are not going to allow the United States to trade with their enemies anymore. And in fact, the British go so far as to impress American sailors and American ships. That is, they stop the ships, they take the folks off, they force them to fight in the British Navy, what have you. And ultimately, in the end, it's a huge fiasco because the United States is a sovereign, independent country. It's free to trade with whomever they wish, and they don't have to adhere to rules put forth by the British and the French. Although at the time, we weren't strong enough to necessarily defeat both of them. So rather than take them on head first, Jefferson implements this Embargo Act, which basically says we're not going to trade with anybody. And the reason why this is important is, one, it serves as a major cause for the War of 1812. Um, one historian says that the War of 1812 is oftentimes referred to as James Madison's War, but in reality, it's Jefferson's War. Um, but the Embargo Act actually sets up a situation whereby the United States is going to begin to manufacture goods and the Industrial Revolution will actually begin to churn. And the reason for it is when Jefferson cut off all trade to Europe, that means that the manufactured goods that the United States was bringing in from Britain are no longer going to be brought in from Britain. And of course, this then encourages and spurs America's own manufacturing. And so in many ways, the Embargo Act come back, comes back to, to really do the exact opposite of what Jefferson wanted the, wanted the country to be. And in the end, the Embargo Act is a major failure. And after a second term in office, Jefferson's like, enough's enough, we're not having this. He goes out, James Madison is elected. And after a brief period of time, James Madison will declare war against Great Britain, uh, and we will go to war with them. Um, we'll talk briefly about some of the, the conflicts during the War of 1812. Uh, probably the key, uh, the key victories would be the Battle of Lake Erie, uh, where Oliver Perry, Hazard, Hazard Power Perry, is having a, has a major victory over the British fleet uh, in, uh, in that region. Uh, and then there's also a major victory at the Battle of New Orleans, which actually takes place after the war is over. In fact, the Treaty of Ghent is signed near Christmas uh, 1814, but due to technology of the day, Jackson doesn't get the memo. He fights a war or fights a battle in New Orleans against the British. It's a major victory. It ushers in a great sense of nationalism and pride and heroism. Um, there's also a major interesting battle at the Battle of Baltimore. It's from the Battle of Baltimore where the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, comes from. Um, but the War of 1812 is significant, and it's significant because, in part, it's really forgotten. It's not a conflict where, in the end, we gained a whole lot. But I think what the War of 1812 does, aside from ushering in industrialization, Aside from ushering in what will become known as the era of good feelings, it really helps to bring about a maturity to the country. The War of 1812 really 
provides the United States its sense of spirit, its soul, if you will. And the way I sort of talk about this is the American Revolution sort of created the country, it created the thing, and then the War of 1812 created the, the essence, its sense, its soul, its spirit, if you will. Um, it's a really significant and interesting war, I think by far more interesting than the American Revolution. Um, for the most part, we lost this conflict. In fact, in 1814, the British will make their way uh, into the capital and burn it down. Uh, it's only thanks to a, a weather uh, storm that comes in that ultimately puts the flames out. But it's a really humiliating moment. And to top it all off, before they burnt the White House down, at the time it was called the President's Mansion, but before they burned that down, they go in, they see that James Madison and his wife Dolly had set up to have a dinner uh, for some diplomats or what have you, and they sit down and they eat all the food, drink all the wine, and then pff, torch the thing. Um, and so it's a really climactic conflict, but perhaps one of the most significant events of the War of 1812 is that it puts sort of the the final nail into the, into the power of the Federalists. Uh, the Federalists party is going to come out against the war, and uh, they do so right at the moment when the Battle of New Orleans happens, and uh, it's just not good for the Federalist Party. And the War of 1812 basically kills them. So, so that's kind of what we're looking at this week. Hopefully that gives you a, a decent overview of things. Um, but if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, as always, go in peace, be warm and filled. May the force be with you. Live long and prosper. And may the odds forever be in your favor. Have a blessed week, guys. And as always, enjoy.